Thank you, Thomas. Um, thank you for the introduction. It's nice to be here. Uh, like Thomas said, my name is Michael Leschke. I'm the Director of Certification Programs at CRS, Center for Resource Solutions. Uh, I've been at CRS for 10 years. And yeah, I mean, summary of what I do is I, I run the, the greedy certification programs. Uh, so yeah, very happy to be here uh, talking to all of you, um, you know, giving my knowledge about RECs and uh, the renewable energy market here uh, in the US. So a little bit about CRS. Um, we're a small organization, but we punch above our weight. Uh, we started in 1997. Our official tagline is uh, creating policy and market solutions to advance sustainable energy. Uh, since 97, we're based in San Francisco, California. Uh, we do a lot of different things. Um, we're most well known for the Greeny certification programs, but we also provide a lot of expert assistance uh, for corporate buyers. Uh, part of the reason why I'm here today, I guess. Uh, we just launched the Clean Energy Accounting Project, uh, which is sort of, um, you know, a, a accounting that goes above and beyond the scope of Green E. Uh, we also host a uh, annual conference called the Renewable Energy Markets Conference, which is a good space uh, for everybody in the voluntary market to get together and talk about different trends and issues, uh, you know, that are that are uh, coming up in the market from year to year. Uh, so getting into really the, the meat of the presentation, um, hopefully you're all aware of what a REC is. If you're not, uh, shorthand, uh, a REC uh, represents the renewable attributes of one megawatt hour of renewable energy generation that hits the grid. Uh, so, you know, there's the generator, uh, say it's a wind turbine, it's uh, generating electricity that is connected to, uh, you know, uh, the, the grid region that you're in. Uh, that generation contains the actual electrons as well as the renewable environmental attributes that are associated with renewable generation. Uh, so that's all the good green stuff, uh, you know, that you associate with wind, wind power or solar power, or so on. Uh, that electricity then, you know, travels through the grid and powers my my computer, my toaster, what, what have you. Uh, but the way to track the renewable attributes is through uh, an electronic tracking system. Um, hopefully, um, you know, some of you are familiar with the tracking systems. I think they're becoming more and more widely used. Uh, but basically, it's a way, uh, I mean, you can think of it like online banking. It's a way to track uh, all of the attributes that are associated with the megawatt hour of uh, electricity generation that's hitting the grid. So there's unique serial ID numbers for each, each megawatt hour. But the tracking systems are, are, are your place to go to look at data on the vintage of that generation, uh, where the facility that generated that electricity uh, is located, uh, who owns uh, the REC, which is, you know, crucial when it comes to reporting and accounting. Uh, and then finally, um, retirement type. So that is what, you know, you are using the REC for, whether it's for voluntary purposes like the Greening Energy Program or a state compliance program like renewable portfolio standards or so on. Uh, so, I mean, the tracking system is really the way uh, to show uh, ownership. It's the way to prove uh, that, you know, you are consuming renewable energy. Um, a little bit, uh, I mean, they provide a lot of oversight, right? Uh, it documents the production based on metered data. Uh, it assures that there's no double counting or double issuance. Uh, and it allows for trading. Um, you know, people can transfer uh, megawatt hours from account to account. Uh, and and you know that you you have the rec if it's in your account. Uh, so it's it's just much more straightforward than doing things contractually because uh, there's a lot of paperwork involved uh, if you're doing things contractually. Uh, and finally, like I mentioned, it's it's the primary way to document uh, retirement, which is crucial for reporting. This is just a, a graphical representation of the way that tracking systems work. Um, I, I think the big takeaways uh, for you guys here is that there's two uh, types of data uh, that's being tracked in tracking systems. Uh, the first is uh, static data, which is you know the the generation information that doesn't change uh, from uh, month to month. So that's like the resource type, the facility location, uh, the facility name, uh, and so on. And then finally, there's dynamic data, which is essentially just uh, the generation that is created and uh, issued in the tracking system from month to month. And obviously that changes, uh, you know, varying uh, on whether it's a particularly sunny month or a particularly windy month or so on. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that the tracking systems, uh, they're administered by, you know, people that are dedicated to, to running the system. Uh, but those people are beholden both to government regulators as well as stakeholder advisory committees. Uh, so that is, you know, those users of the tracking systems, uh, whether it is generators, 
uh, supply companies, traders, large buyers, or so on. So you actually have a voice when it comes to the way that tracking systems are are managed. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize that. If you have, if you're, you know, frustrated frustrated with the way that your tracking system is working, um, you have the ability to let the administrators know that you want to see changes. Uh, so that's that's one thing that I want to kind of uh, just, you know, let the market know. All right, with tracking systems taken care of, uh, the, the key takeaway for Rex is that they're needed to allocate and claim use of renewable energy generation on a shared grid. And that's true both in the voluntary and regulatory market. I mean, RECs are really the currency uh, that make the, the market work. Um, ownership of RECs are used to uh, help avoid double counting and double claiming, uh, which I will get into a little bit more detail on uh, examples of those pitfalls a little, uh, a little bit later in this presentation. Uh, but RECs also create a national market for renewable energy. So, I mean, we're, we're all aware that there are disparate grids uh, uh, across North America, uh, but RECs could be traded, uh, you know, across the entire the, the entire market, uh, whereas electricity necessarily um, can't necessarily be traded, you know, from one grid to the next. So RECs are crucial in in creating a national market and gives me the ability if I'm in a geographic location where uh, maybe renewable energy isn't so plentiful uh to you know purchase a rec and then pair it with my consumption to be able to say that I am consuming uh renewable energy. Uh I, I think we're we're all aware uh over the past couple of years that I mean voluntary renewable energy is is really booming right now. Uh so this graph shows uh the amount of megawatt hours that Greeny is certified in the voluntary market uh since you know the program first started. Uh Greeny is the lion's share of um of generation that's used in the voluntary market, but uh, not all of it by by any means. Uh, so there is, you know, a portion of, of uh, megawatt hours that uh, are being used voluntarily that don't necessarily go through Greeny. But the takeaway uh, on this graph is the 2020 line really shows, you know, extreme growth in, in that year. Uh, we're actually just collecting our 2021 data, uh, and it looks like we're going to certify about 110 million megawatt hours. So, I mean, that's off of this graph. Um, I'm personally, uh, I mean, very happy, but a little bit shocked at the amount of renewable energy that we've, we've seen uh, certified through our program. Uh, and, and, you know, this is during a pandemic too. So a lot of things that were maybe uh, planned for pre-COVID are, are still being realized and finalized. And, and you know, they're, if, they're, if we're talking generators, they're not necessarily built yet. Uh, so, I mean, I expect this growth to to continue. It is a little bit hockey stick shaped right now, which is, you know, exciting. And with the recent uh, federal legislation that passed, you know, fingers crossed, we really uh, can see this type of growth sustained over uh, the next couple of years. Uh, this graph on the left really shows, um, you know, the voluntary market and the compliance market, uh, you know, as the total uh, renewable energy market in the U.S., uh, key takeaway here is that the two markets kind of spur each other on to growth. Uh, you know, a lot of people might consider the compliance market, voluntary market in competition with each other because you can't use the same megawatt hour for both markets. Uh, but that's not the truth. Uh, we've seen as as the compliance market, you know, uh, as more and more states uh, have renewable portfolio standards or or uh, they they make the renewable portfolio standards more stringent. The compliance market grows and the voluntary market grows alongside with that, perhaps due to uh, increased awareness. Um, the two markets spur each other on to growth. They're not in competition with each other. So uh, the compliance market is, is certainly uh, the majority of the voluntary market, but the, vol uh, or the, the compliance market is the majority of the renewable energy market, um, but the voluntary market has been growing in, in share uh, over the past couple of years as well. And that's what the graph on the right really demonstrates is that uh, the past couple of years, uh, most of the renewable energy uh, capacity additions uh, come from uh, the non-RPS, which means the voluntary market. Uh, and, you know, I, I think at this point, states that have RPSs uh, are probably the states that will have RPSs. I don't anticipate uh, too many other states, you know, creating uh, uh, renewable portfolio standards in a compliance market. Uh, that's not to say that the states with RPSs won't continue to uh, have more stringent um, mandates, uh, but by and large, the new growth that you're seeing is dedicated to the voluntary market, which is something that's very exciting, you know, to, to me who works in the voluntary space. 
Uh, at this point, I think you know we're we're all aware that that climate change is here. It's happening. It's not about mitigation anymore, but it's about adaptation uh, and ways for businesses to to protect themselves about some of the adverse effects of climate change is through investing in renewable energy. It's through investing in things like uh, storage. Uh, and we've we've seen over the past couple of years, you know, the amount of of money uh, that people are being forced to spend on climate change related issues is is you know, relatively increasing over time. Uh, so again, I mean, it's it's smart business to really invest in things that make you more resilient uh, in the face of, you know, the climate uh, challenges that we're facing. Uh, and by and large, we've seen companies do just that. Uh, companies are, are setting large goals, uh, but there's, there's a long road ahead. I mean, if you're committed to 100% renewable, uh, the sun's not always shining, the wind's not always blowing. Uh, and so as we get closer to 100, I think it's going to be more and more difficult to, you know, procure that last amount that takes you to the goals that are being set, uh, which is not, you know, to be discouraging. It's just to say that, you know, we have to find uh, increasingly creative ways uh, to procure renewable energy. And I, I think we've seen that over the market with the advent of, of PPAs and BPPAs. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how things, you know, kind of shape out in the next uh, couple of years, especially in light of, of the federal legislation that just passed. A little bit more about procurement. I, I mean, I think you're all aware of the different ways uh, to procure renewable generation. Um, I saw that a lot of you are already investing in, in on-site generation, which is great. Uh, on-site is, is, you know, perfect way to understand how renewable energy works. Uh, but, you know, PPAs, uh, virtual PPAs, uh, those of you that have, you know, sophisticated uh, renewable energy divisions in, in your corporations could really dedicate the time and effort uh, uh, that's needed to deal directly with the generators themselves. Uh, direct purchasing is an increasing uh, area, you know, that we've seen, uh, particularly, I mean, starting like five or so years ago. Uh, and, you know, there's there's different ways to contract with these individual uh, uh, generators or, or developers. Uh, there are some best practices. Um, CRS is, is a good resource uh, uh, for, uh, you know, how to contract with uh, generators. But, you know, if, if that is a bridge too far and if it takes too much effort and, you know, there's, there's not the bandwidth uh, uh, to dedicate, you know, to dealing directly with the generators, there's always the option of retail purchasing. So that's purchasing from rec marketers uh, through your local utility if they're offering a uh, utility green pricing program uh, and so on. And retail purchasing is, is still, you know, the majority of how a renewable energy is being, being procured uh, here in North America. Uh, but direct purchasing and self-generation have been increasing over the years too. Uh, the main thing with all of these purchases uh, all of these purchase avenues is that RECs must be maintained uh, in order to make claims for all renewable energy uh, procurement methods. There's different risks associated with uh, with each purchasing option. Uh, self-generation, I mean, self-generation is great, but usually if we're talking about on-site generation, there's only so much roof space. Uh, and so if you have, you know, a, a hefty commitment to renewable energy, uh, self-generation is only going to get us part of the way there. Um, so th that's that's something you know to keep in mind. Uh, direct purchasing is is a good way to lock into a certain price point for a longer period of time. That also kind of represents some risk. I mean, we've we've seen the price of renewable energy uh, fluctuate, um, you know, over over the years uh, where. Actually, you know, self-generation is more affordable than ever, but the price of, of Rex uh, just last year, um, you know, went up to an all-time high of, of $7 or something like that. Whereas a few years ago, we were talking about, you know, 50 cents for a megawatt hour. Uh, and so, I mean, long-term purchasing is great. It drives the market forward, but it also represents some risk uh, when it comes to price. And we're talking about retail purchasing uh, the risk is really on um, just the what's what's available to you. You have more flexibility when you're dealing directly with the generators themselves rather than dealing with uh, uh, you know a middleman, a rec seller, or or your local utility. Uh, and so, in order to meet your goals, uh, you might not be able to find completely what you're looking for on the retail purchasing side. So again, I think that's one of the reasons why we've seen an increase in direct purchasing uh, over the past couple of years. 
Uh, there is a lot of different reporting schemes, which is, I, I think, probably one of the reasons why you guys are on this webinar. Um, I don't want to toot Greeny's horn too much, but one of the easiest ways to, to make sure that you're meeting the different eligibility criteria of uh, different reporting schemes is through purchasing uh, Greeny's Certified Electricity or, or uh, RECs. I, I know sometimes, you know, there's there's a premium that's associated with Greeny generation, but that's because, you know, you're getting, you know, the best practiced, highest quality renewable energy generation, and you know it can be used for whatever you want to report it for. Uh, that said, I mean, I, I know uh, affordability is always an issue, especially when we're talking about, you know, $7 uh, for a megawatt hour. Um, <clears throat> just some good rules of thumb. Uh, I mean, think about resource types when you're purchasing. Wind and solar are always, you know, eligible uh, under different reporting schemes, uh, whereas, you know, certain biomass resource types might have eligibility restrictions. Likewise, try to purchase as, as new as possible. So that's facilities that are uh, 15 years old or younger. Uh, older generation might not always qualify for different reporting schemes. Uh, things like hydro can be tricky. Uh, Greeny, in our eligibility criteria, we require low impact hydro power institute certified uh, dams uh, in order uh, for that hydro megawatt hour to be certified. Uh, some reporting mechanisms uh, don't have that restriction. You can you can source from something like the Hoover Dam. I mean, after all, it's not there's not any uh, emissions that are associated with that generation. Uh, so you know when you're navigating the different reporting uh, schemes. Eligibility criteria can vary, but these rules of thumb um, should help get you to where you need to go. Uh, but of course, um, you know, I can't recommend buying Greeny certified supply enough. Um, top of the line, uh, and, and you know when you're purchasing something that's certified, it's gonna be good for whatever you're using it for. Uh, some other tips, just to make sure that you're getting the full benefit of, of your purchase. Uh, avoid double claims. Uh, so a good example of a double claim is is with on-site generation. Uh, let's say that you know you're you're a company um, and you know uh, you are procuring recs from an on-site uh, facility, like let's say an elementary school that has solar panels on it. Um, if that elementary school is talking about the solar power that it is you know generating on site, uh, and saying that it's a green power of school or something to that effect, uh, the school is effectively claiming those recs. If they sell those megawatt hours to somebody else, that means that there's two competing parties claiming the same attributes on the same megawatt hour of generation, uh, which obviously lessens the value of your purchase. One of the things that Greeny uh, actively guards against is, is protecting against those double claims and require, requiring a uh, replacement supply uh, if a double claim is caught through our verification process. Um, so that's one thing to watch out for. Uh, avoid double counting with state requirements. I mentioned earlier, you can't use the same megawatt hour for a state renewable portfolio standard uh, and then use that towards your voluntary goal. Uh, double counting, again, is one of the things that tracking systems help to guard against. The retirement reason that's listed in the tracking system is extremely clear as to what that megawatt hour is being used for. Uh, but you know, again, best rule of thumb, Voluntary market and compliance market don't mix. Finally, make sure uh, the greenhouse gas benefits are included. And so my next couple of slides are actually gonna describe a situation uh, in states that have uh, cap and trade programs and how uh, sometimes uh, greenhouse gas benefits that are associated with voluntary generation in those states aren't being fully realized. Actually, I'll skip, I'll skip straight to that. So states that have cap and trade, uh, that's California, uh, states in the, the Northeast that are participating in the Regional Greenhouse Gas uh, Initiative, um, as well as Quebec. Uh, this picture here on the left, you know, shows the initial cap, the initial cap that's being set uh, on emissions from the electricity sector. Uh, picture on the right shows a reduced cap in year three. Usually, you know, the cap kind of uh, accelerates over time. In states uh, where there is cap and trade, when you're looking at voluntary renewable energy, uh, new voluntary renewable energy reduces emissions, which creates space under the cap. Uh, effectively, what that does is allows fossil fuel emissions uh, to fill that, uh, you know, that that space that the voluntary energy, uh, the voluntary renewable energy generation uh, created. It allows people to pollute that much more, you know, because of the voluntary action that I'm taking. 
one of the things that Green E helps protect against uh, is to ensure that that space is 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 uh, effectively retired. So we uh, we require that allowances, carbon emission allowances, are retired on behalf of voluntary renewable energy generation, uh, which you know creates it, it ensures that that space is not being filled with fossil fuels. It ensures that the whoever the obligated entity is, whether it's the utility or whoever. Uh, is is going out and procuring more renewable energy generation and not just using my voluntary generation to meet their uh, cap. So that's that's one thing to make sure you're kind of protecting against uh, when you're purchasing in states that have uh, cap and trade uh, uh, schemes. You want to make sure that you're getting the full value of your purchase. Uh, and if people are just polluting that much more because of your purchase, you're you're not really right. Um, Going on to double claims, I mean, I mentioned the, the school uh, uh, example where, you know, the school says our solar canopy will produce enough energy to power 30% of the school with renewable energy. Uh, and if they are concurrently selling off those recs to another party, that constitutes a double claim. Um, and so again, uh, you're not getting the full value of your purchase uh, if, if you're buying generation that's double claimed. Uh, finally, um, there are some States that have uh, unique regulations such as uh, uh, renewable energy multipliers or carve outs, uh, which effectively cause double counting um, uh, with, with the voluntary market. So, for example, in Texas, uh, anything that is non wind uh, that was built, I think, after 2005 receives an instrument that's called the compliance premium per megawatt hour that's used for RPS compliance. So, again, this is the this is a case where you have one megawatt hour that is uh, the benefits of that megawatt hour effectively being counted both towards the compliance market and the voluntary market. So again, one of the things that Greeny protects against is, is making sure uh, that any compliance premiums that were issued in this example uh, would be retired and not used uh, to meet RPS requirements. Um, just some final things uh, on, on greenhouse gas benefits. Uh, how you define a, a product in a PPA or, or other procurement agreement is, is important. And I'm sure you know, this is stuff that your legal teams have all uh, worked through. Uh, but it's, it's important to have a clear cut definition of a rec. I mean, it seems relatively straightforward, but if you know, whoever you're buying from has a different understanding of, of what the attributes are that you're purchasing, that creates contractual risk. So defining RECs, defining environmental attributes, uh, including what those greenhouse gas benefits are in the contract itself is, is extremely crucial. Uh, also defining future environmental attributes uh, uh, is, is important. I mean, it's not clear uh, 10 years from now that there's not going to be you know, some other compliance mechanism uh, that comes into effect uh, which you know a crafty counterparty might use as an excuse to effectively you know count uh, the megawatt hour that you've contracted for towards that that uh, uh, scheme, whatever it might be. Uh, so defining what happens to future environmental attributes is crucial in contracting. Uh, finally, facility attributes. I mean that is jobs, that type of stuff uh, that renewable energy generators create. Uh, that could be crucial to define in a contract as well. Uh, and know that sellers should be obligated to give you guys uh, uh, some information and some uh, uh, clear cut uh, uh, terms and conditions uh, throughout the term. So that means like the cost of registration uh, in a tracking system, uh, the cost of Greeny certification, the cost of facility upgrades, all that stuff, again, is important to define um, in your contracts with your counterparties. So that really does it for my presentation. Um, I will pass it over to Lisa. But one uh, short uh, uh, advertisement for our Renewable Energy Markets Conference. It's happening in Minneapolis uh, uh, next month, uh, September 14th uh, and through the 16th. Like I said, it's a great space uh, for everybody to get, uh, everybody that's working in the voluntary market to get together uh, to discuss you know, issues and trends that come up uh, year in, year out. EPA is there, uh, buyers are there, sellers are there, and obviously uh, CRS and Greeny is there. So hope to see you in Minneapolis. Uh, if you have any questions for me, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, that's what CRS is here to do. Uh, thank you, and uh, I look forward to answering your questions.
Man, and speaking of questions, there are a ton of them, Michael. Either you did so fantastic because there's some really detailed ones, or you went so quick that like people and people are so new to this that they, they there's a lot to learn. Uh, but we do have a lot of questions. With that we're said, we're not going to stop just yet. We're going to jump over and have Lisa uh, really provide the end user perspective. So as I mentioned, Lisa's coming to us from HNI, you know, one of our really excellent partners in the program. And so she's going to be talking about, you know, renewables, renewable energy credits from the end user perspective. So with that said, Lisa, I can see your screen. Uh, you're good to go. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you, Michael. I think that was a great presentation, even for me that uh, you know, I would say I'm not a rep expert. I'm drinking from the fire hose as we all are. Um, uh, we had a member on my team that was more specialized in this. And when he left the organization, I've been uh, picking up this responsibility and learning a lot about how to purchase and the different options out there. So I can share with you my experience as it relates to that and the things I've learned along the way. Um, but just to start off, my name is Lisa Bruni McDermott. I'm the Director of Corporate Social Responsibility at H&I. Um, and H&I is a family of brands that service the office and the home. So we manufacture uh, residential building products like fireplaces or hearths, as well as office furniture. So that's kind of the space we live in. Um, our headquarters is based out of Muscatine, Iowa, and our corporate social responsibility program is really uh, focused on making better choices today for a better tomorrow. So with that, we have a lot of goals that we're trying to achieve by 2035, um, and uh, some of those are around a commitment of purchasing 100% renewable uh, electricity for our global operations. We have goals, SBTI goals, um, to reduce our carbon emissions uh, related to scope one and two. We have a scope three greenhouse gas goal, and then we're also trying to drive energy intensity. So with our REC purchases or with renewable energy in general, um, we really feel like that's a part of our climate change strategy. So um, by uh, acquiring or using renewable energy or acquiring the, the RECs, um, we are able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions or um, you know, contribute towards that reduction in our scope two emissions. We are, um, you know, believe strongly in supporting that renewable energy market. And then the other side of this is, you know, we have a certain product sustainability certification that we maintain. So our REC purchases and our renewable energy generation contributes towards some of those product certification claims. Um, we've also committed to RE100 and EPA Green Power Partners. So we have joined those commitments to, um, to just have that continued goal of purchasing renewable energy uh, for our facilities. So in terms of the types of renewable energy we purchase or um, utilize, uh, we are definitely always looking at um, self-generation and on-site solar. We have limited um, presence of this currently, but we're um, looking at this as part of our long-term strategy for reducing our CO2 emissions, reducing our, um, our, our energy usage overall in terms of um, you know, that is part of our strategy is to look at how we can bring more solar on site. Um, but in the meantime, we've really been focusing a lot on unbundled direct. So this is the space I'll share more about of how we do this and the process that I take to purchase those recs. Um, so unbundled recs, you know, just to kind of hit on what it is, again, it's not tied to a power purchase agreement. It's just the uh, you're getting that credit that's separate from the physical electricity. So we go out to commodity brokers and purchase these recs and, um, you know, Greeny is a type of unbundled rec that we prefer to purchase. We have been looking at different power purchase agreements. Uh, we don't have one in place currently, but this is something we continuously discuss with finance and our legal team and, um, you know, are driving towards in the future. And then we do have a program with our local uh, utility provider for uh, green power that we purchase through them and that they supply us the recs. So in terms of how I purchase them, um, so again, this is specifically related to the unbundled recs. Um, but I, you know, one of the things we started to look at this year too is any facilities where we have deregulated states and they can offer green power um, through their contracts. So at this point, we haven't shifted any of those contracts because 
they're all uh, existing and current. So that is something we want to look more towards in the future is, is there any option there to purchase renewable directly and get those recs um, or those credits in our name um, and potentially avoid the rec purchase on the back end? Um, but really what I do regularly, so I typically on a quarterly basis will review our energy usage and then reach out to commodity brokers on current pricing. So we have about four commodity brokers that we've worked with and they've all gone through our legal and procurement process to be vetted as vendors. Um, but I reach out to them and just see what pricing is. You know, I would say um, last year that was a gigantic change for us. I think at some point recs were around $6 a megawatt hour, where this year we're seeing more um, around $2. So we're getting pretty good pricing currently, even for green e recs, which is really exciting because I had to up my budget pretty substantially um, when I thought the market would continue to be a lot higher. But really, I evaluate my energy usage, reach out to my brokers to see what pricing is. My preferences are green E. Um, for my international facilities, I buy IREX. Um, as Michael mentioned, we prefer the wind and solar. We do purchase some hydro, and especially last year when prices were so high, we did purchase some hydro. Um, but we do prefer wind, solar, and local facilities, newer facilities. And, and I you know, just highlight too on that of checking the age of the facility, making sure you're um, asking those questions when you're doing the purchasing. And then we'll initiate a contract if the pricing is favorable and actually move towards purchasing those recs. Um, once I've received the contract or once I, the rec is retired, there's specific information that I record to as well as saving the documents. So this slide just shows my table at the bottom of for all my rec purchases, what do I, um, what do I record? So you know I'll record who was the provider, um, what amount did I purchase, who is it allocated to, the contract date, the delivery date, the attestation number, so that ID number for those recs, you know, is it Green E, was it an IREC, where is it coming from or the region, um, the type, is it wind, solar, hydro, vintage, generator, um, and then cost. This is the way that I track it, so that's kind of my recommendation is to have a system because I'm always trying to balance, you know, my uh, usage and then truing up to make sure I reach that 100%, um, you know, megawatt to megawatt usage to rec purchased. Um, so that's kind of the way that we we do that. And, and the rec generally includes this information. So either the contract or the rec itself will have this information for me to track. The other thing is because we've signed on to these different commitments and, and Michael talked about how Green E supports them, but I just wanted to highlight because I've had to really dive into this myself, some of the requirements for the RECs to be eligible in these programs. And of course, you know, the renewable energy type is the requirement for RE100 and EPA Green Power, um, but the facility age is specifically called out in EPA Green Power as it has to be in service. Um, within the last 15 years. Um, Greeny are both um, uh, strongly preferred uh, in those programs. And then there are some requirements for market limitation or market boundary, sorry, um, in terms of where it's produced relative to your facilities. And then the vintage, so making sure that it's close to the reporting year or um, up to six months prior to the reporting year. Um, so there, I just, wanted to provide this summary because I think between RE100 and Green Power to make sure that um, there's a clear understanding on what those requirements are and then how it connects to things like CDP or better plants or partners. So for CDP, they're really following RE100 and for um, for the DOE programs, um, uh, they helped me put together this information, but at this point, there's no documented requirements there. Um, they are letting you um, attribute that towards your greenhouse gas uh, reduction. And I can let the DOE folks clarify on that better, but I did just wanna, as a learning, this has been really important for me to understand the requirements of these individual programs that we've signed up for, because I've kind of joined in the middle of, of this for H&I. Um, but I hope that was helpful uh, in just sharing our, how this ties to our company goals. Um, the process that we undertake to purchase it, and then the requirements we look at. And with that, that's, that's all I had to share. So thank you.